Hi, and welcome, everyone. I'm Sabine Wiesander. I'm a partner at the VC firm Creandum. And I'm here with Johannes Schilt, CEO and founder of Cre, a multi-billion dollar healthcare company out of the Nordics. Welcome, Johannes. Well, thank you. Good to be here. Good to see you, Sabina. Good to see you. We are here to talk about scaling billion dollar companies in highly regulated markets. So some of the most regulated markets are also the industries that are the least touched by software. Education, energy, healthcare is just some of them. But there are entrepreneurs that are taking on these industries and that are trailblazing. And Johannes, you are one of them. I am, yeah. So I will ask Johannes to share insights of what it takes to scale a company, not only in a highly regulated market, but a business that has as its core business model to be reimbursed by the public sector. And hopefully you will get some insights to take on your own journey. So let's get started. Let's so get started. Let's get started. Johannes, Cree is a digital first healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. How many patients have you helped to date? Uh, we helped a bit more than 7 million patients across Europe by now. 7 million patients. And for those in the audience who is not one of 7 million patients, what is Cree? Well, to put it simple, it's a um, healthcare clinic in your phone where you could meet clinicians within minutes, um, psychologists, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists. And we operate this across Europe, based in Stockholm, but also operating at scale now in France and the UK. Um, ambition have always been to be a, a mass market service, to be something for everyone. And obviously, in order to achieve that within healthcare, you do have to, as you said, address the, the public healthcare systems and, and partnering with public payers. So that's what we usually do. And then also we partner with private healthcare private insurance and uh, sometimes also go directly to patients and uh, through employers. So uh, that's what we do and the majority of what we in healthcare we deliver is pure digital and then we also put a lot of effort during the latest years to knit together the patient journeys and link our digital offering to physical healthcare as well. Where we're now starting to operate um, a light touch network of physical clinics in some key areas. Um, yeah. So that's what we do. Mm. So digital healthcare wasn't tough enough. You're also doing uh, adding physical clinics to, to the problem. Yeah, I think it's, for us it's been important that digital healthcare is not a siloed system and then you have everything else. I think it's clear for us that most or all healthcare journeys will eventually start digitally and then in the majority of the cases we will be able to treat our patients end-to-end -end through pure digital. But obviously in some cases we need to... You know, link patients further down the healthcare journey and also you know, do physical healthcare. And we do that you know, mainly through partnerships, but also to some extent we do it by ourselves. Um, yeah, so that's what we do. And at core, we are a you know, technology and product company, but we also um, operate healthcare ourselves at scale. So we do employ and train an awful lot of clinicians across Europe. Wow, impressive. And why did you start this company? Are you coming from the healthcare side of things? No, I'm not. Well, I am because I'm a patient as everyone else. So um, it's, a lot of it is out of own needs. I've been a patient in the Swedish healthcare system as most Swedes and been frustrated at how bad part of it is structured. I think in Europe, we're in general, we're fairly spoiled with high quality of care, but there's you know, been a truly lack of access and a lack of efficiencies. And we, thought there must be better ways of producing and delivering care. So we started building what we now have been doing for quite some time. Um, but no, I had very little experience from the healthcare sector uh, before starting to And in one way, I think it's been a positive. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we're all curious to know how much did you know about regulation in, in healthcare before you went on this journey? Well, the very honest answer is that I didn't know anything about regulations in healthcare when we initially started. And as I said, I think it's um, in, in one way uh, it's, it could have been a positive because what we do is complex. It is it's very regulated. It's, um, it's complex. Um, but sometimes it's rather good to be a bit naive when it comes to addressing new things mm. and just jump 
straight into it. I think for us it's always been ultra clear that what we do is a big part of the future. Um, but uh, no, we didn't know that much about regulations when we initially started. Now we do. Now we know a lot about it. Now you know. And if you knew back then what you know now about public reimbursement, about regulation, what would you have done differently? I'm not sure that I would have done so much differently. Well, obviously, I think we have played sort of slightly different roles in different markets we've been addressing, and all of the markets that we're in, and if you look into Europe now and the world, all of markets are on slightly different levels of maturity when it comes to regulations and how you structure reimbursement systems in healthcare, etc. Um, and the role we played in Sweden for a long time was really trying to sort of push the system forward. Um, and I think that we've done that in a fairly good way. Um, uh, no, I'm not sure that we would have done so much differently. Obviously, we've made a lot of mistakes, and sometimes you could have been you know, pushed harder, pushed less. Uh, we have sometimes you know, addressed new segments or markets too early. Um, but I uh, no, don't have a clear answer to that question. And when you say pushing, you know, pushing the system, Obvious as a startup, you know, you've all experienced how limited your resources are. Should you try to influence policy and regulation in the market that you are in? And can you, as a startup, take that role? I think you have to. I think you definitely need to be in the conversations as the most you know, large sectors. It's, you have regulation, right? Healthcare is, you know, it's 10, 11 percent of GDP in all European markets, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's us addressing public systems. There's a lot of regulations and and, um, and uh, complexity, and I think that you, obviously, you need to be in conversations about how to push things forward. Um, then you can't sit back and wait until things are changing. Right? I think you need to also play the role as sort of challenging the system. Um, I think our main challenge has been like, addressing healthcare and doing it at a scale. If you look into the healthcare systems right now, it's, 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 it's very local. Regulations are built up um, around physical healthcare delivery. That's not what we do at core. And then you know, sometimes you have to and you need to, to, to challenge that. But we have always taken the public policy side very seriously and, and put a lot of time and effort and really trying to be around the table and discuss the future of how healthcare should and could look like. Uh, and that requires time and effort, it does, but I think it's definitely worth it and I don't think it's any way around that really. Mm. So, you know, spending time on it, being in the dialogues, but maybe not expecting to you know, mo move the whole European framework all at once. <laughs> no, that, that will unfortunately not happen. But if you look back when we initially started, there was no reimbursement infrastructure for digital healthcare in any European markets. When we launched in Sweden, there was you know, no payment model for it. Now there is a lot, of things, a lot of things have changed during the years that we have been in this industry. Um, and a part of that is obviously us, you know, really trying hard and showing that this is doable, and this serves a real need, and it works. Right? That was not. Now it might sound like a given that what we do, digital healthcare, is an obvious and critical part of any healthcare system. But that was not the case when we started. That was something that was, you know, completely new, and we had a lot of skepticism around what we're doing. And people said, "No, you can't do it. This can't be done. It's no need for it." Um, but you know, we showed the, the world and our patients and partners that mm. what we do is actually of real, real value. And from us, even though we started out of a you know, pure patient perspective, obviously what we do, we need to you know, serve both patients and you know, clinicians that work with us and for us. And we obviously also need to serve the needs of our partners. And as I said, that's mainly you know, governments and public systems. No. And they tend to be fairly regulated, and they also tend to be fairly conservative. Um, yeah. And so you're showing the way, you're showing it can be done, you know, you're, you're going on the forefront. And then a pandemic came. How did that affect, you know, uh, being in this, in a, in a healthcare market? And, you know, has that affected the policymakers' way of looking at software, you think? Yeah, I think. For, for us, I would argue that the biggest change during the pandemic had been on the policy and regulatory side. 
I think even though even when we started, there was a clear demand from the patient side. People don't want to call a landline early in the morning and travel long distances and sit in a waiting room in a GP practice and hopefully get a time slot. You know, it's, there are more efficient ways of solving it, and that has been clear for us, and it's also been clear for, for, for patients. Um, it's been maybe less clear on the, from the clinician side and on the payer side uh, up until recently. This shift started long before the pandemic, it did, but the pandemic did definitely accelerated it. And um, now I would argue that it's, it is well anchored everywhere in all healthcare systems that what we do is a critical part of the infrastructure of healthcare moving forward. Mm. Uh, then, you know, the pandemic has been, it's been strange, right, because uh, part of the healthcare system has been under severe pressure, but healthcare usage have, during the whole pandemic, actually been on an all-time low, and, and uh, many um, healthcare systems have basically put everything on pause. In, in the UK, you almost have 10 million people waiting to get a doctor's appointment because everything were, were paused for a Wow, well, 10 million people waiting yeah, for a no, doctor's it, appointment. The European healthcare systems are under severe pressure. That's, that's a fact. Mm. And uh, you can't solve that by just continuing to do what you have been doing before. And that's now finally starting to be clear to our partners that you do have to, to structure how you deliver healthcare moving forward in a different way. And that's yeah. a big opportunity for us, obviously. Yeah. And do you think there are, you know, policymakers who understand what needs to be done that are you know, pushing the rest of you know, their peers towards a future where software plays a bigger role in you know, public sector or highly regulated markets? Yeah, no, there are obviously there are champions, obviously, and if you look back in the early days of, of, of CRU, I think we were fairly successful at identifying those individuals or regions in our first market, Sweden, that were you know, less conservative or more pro trying new ways of delivering care and sort of like using them as a champion. Uh, so, yeah, I would argue that things definitely are moving forward. Then, I think there's usually and sometimes there's a lack of understanding how technology actually works and what it what will mean and we have um, but yeah no, there are definitely mm. people that do understand yeah. so there's not only a problem of will there's also a problem of not understanding what regulations st stand yeah, in the way I think of that we innovation have, quite a lot of examples where you have, you know, regulations clearly sort of blocking innovation and demand, or not demand, but blocking innovation. And usually that is not you now by bad intent from regulators, it's just um, lack of understanding what the decisions will lead to. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Also a reason why you need to be in the conversations and try to educate people. Yeah, continue to have conversations, try to get them on board, try, them, try to understand, them, get them to understand what the future looks like. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to try to get vulnerable for, for a few minutes. I oh. uh, wondered if you can share with the audience any you know, big mistake that you look back on on the journey of, of building this huge uh, company and you know, something you brought from that. Oh, big mistakes, but we've been doing this for a while, so obviously we've done a lot of mistakes, and it comes to you know, regulations and policy, I think that we sometimes had a tendency of maybe pushing too hard, and sometimes had a tendency of pushing, you know, we could have pushed harder, right? And we have had, we've launched markets that have not been ready from a regulatory perspective, we've launched new services, but you know, timing was not right. So, you know, obviously when you look back, there's a lot of things that you could have done, <laughs> done, done differently, that's obviously um. mm. but it's uh, it's been uh, kind of trying to find the balance of what's pushing enough to keep moving at the startup speed but of course within you yeah, know, the I mean, regulatory I mean, realm that uh, that you're yeah. acting in and i think with healthcare it's like it's, it's it's very local so part of what we do is very scalable on the technology side and operation side what we do is fairly similar in the different markets but how the healthcare systems are structured it's, it's very different between the different markets and when we initially launched in sweden there were nothing like right? we pushed it forward and when we initially launched we launched as a private service and our main argument to the public sector was like this this will happen anyhow right like so if we don't make sure that this is a part of the public healthcare systems this will be like a premium channel for the few that can afford to pay for better access we don't want to do that and that will undermine the trust of the public healthcare systems like so it's 
it's, uh, in, you know, it's different arguments that we have used in different points in time. And as I said, the markets have been at a very different level of maturity. I would argue that the, U the UK have been rather good at this. It's been well anchored for a long period of time that digital healthcare is a part of the future. That was not the case in Sweden when we initially launched. Um, and, and for those of you, I mean, I assume most people are, are not from Sweden here, so that's where most of the digital health in, in Europe started. And now we see that, you know, most of the, the, the regions that are operating public healthcare are launching their own apps. And obviously, you know, that would never have happened unless you guys, you know, went on to show the way of, you know, what, what should be the first step of interacting with the healthcare system. Yeah, I think for the first, like the first way for us was to show that this is actually doable, right? And like now it's anchored that it's doable, then it's like, how, who should do it? How should it be implemented? How should it be reimbursed, etc. But like we passed that first stage where, you know, is this a real thing or not? Now that's yeah. obviously it's a, it's a real thing. And it's more a question about like, who should do it? <laughs> should you allow private companies to operate in this space or not? or um, how should it be paid for and who should pay for it, etc. Mm. And, you know, we're all aware we need, you know, regulations in all our industry for them to, you know, function in a, in a well manner. But as a highly innovative companies, can you turn these, you know, very strictly regulated environments, can you turn that into uh, an advantage? Yeah, I think you, you, you can because that is a barrier to entry. It, is, it can be frustrated frustrating to operate in a highly regulated market, but it's also certain advantages. If you're starting to be good at it, that's a part of your moat. Mm. I think we started to reach a point where, where it is, right? It's a strategic advantage to us. We know that very well, and we can sort of, I think, you just have to embrace it. You just have to sort of roll up your sleeves and dig into it. I think there's no way around it. If you want to operate in you know, healthcare and other highly re regulated industries, like you can't shy away from it. Like you just have to embrace that you operate in a regulated environment and then try your best to use that to your advantage. Mm. Um, and I mean, there is some of, some of the largest global industries are also the most highly regulated. So the price, if you do, you know, make it, it's, it's very big, right? And I guess, you know, what you're saying is it's not for everyone, but that also means that it will be less crowded. Yeah, if you look into what we do, like we, do, we don't have that much competition on a pan-European scale. We have local competition in all the markets that we're in, and part of that is because there's quite a lot of heavy lifting to address a new market, to understand regulations and reimbursement systems and you know, fire, find a payer model, etc. And um, you know, it's two sides of the coin of complexity. It's, it's tough and it's hard, but you, as I said, you can also use it to your advantage, and it is a part of... Of, mm. It's yep. a barrier of entry. I know another Nordic example is the uh, scooter company Voy that are, you know, they're so good at managing policies in the cities that they operate in. So their main agenda is to push for more policies because they are the only company that can actually handle those kind of frameworks and, you know, the public agenda that they're pushing. So they're actually want, they're pushing for more regulation on the scooter side because they think that's one you know, the way for them to be able to operate, period. And two, of course, to have less comp competition in the market. Mm. So we see it, you know, also in other, other industries than healthcare, right? Mm. Many entrepreneurs uh, in the audience, I assume, what would be your advice to entrepreneurs building, not only in healthcare, but in other you know, highly regulated markets? An advice to founder if you operate in a highly regulated market. I think some of the things that I've already said, I think, you know, there's no way around it. You, you should try to be in the conversations. Um, you know, go out, meet policymakers, talk to, 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 to regulators. Um, I think, again, I think you should, you know, really dip, dip, dig deep into it and try to use it to your advantage. Um, as I said, there's, like, there's, there's, there's no way ar around it, 
really. So uh, no, just you know, em embrace it. <laughs> yeah, become really good at it, think, better than everyone else. I think sort of in the, in the beginning we were sort of it, it was a bit frustrating. So when you realize that this is this is fairly tough, right? So you're like, oh god, this is this is this is really tough. There's a lot of things that we need to learn. It's highly regulated. And then at first you get frustrated about it. But I think you know, then early on we reached a point. We like we, we will just embrace this. We will we will we will we will try our best to be good at it. Mm. And I think that would be my main advice would be to just you know no, don't shy away from it uh, try to embrace it mm. embrace it lean into it yeah yeah i mean if it was easy everyone would have done it we would have yeah, you know the same amount like, of software in in healthcare and education as yeah. we have in other sectors yeah now like in, in some of our core markets as in sweden like we have you know we have, we have, we have access to the full population we have 25 percent of the households that sign up with the service you know Kryn, it's, a, it's a power brand so everyone is aware of it and people use it and it's like now it's painfully obvious that what we do is you know is, is, is needed but that was not 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 the case before so um yeah just just you know yeah roll up your sleeves yeah dig deep yeah and try to embrace it yeah and I don't know if there's any policymakers in the audience, but if there is, you know, what would you say to them, or what well, do you say to them? Well, I would probably say the same thing. I try to engage with innovators and companies and, and, and startups. I think if you look in some of into like healthcare, it's, it's it's obvious to me and a lot of other people that you know you will you know, private companies would play a big role in 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 in. in uh, solving some of the um, crisis within the healthcare sector, so like and engage with, with with companies and innovators, and try to understand what you know policy and regulations can do to actually enable more innovation and not you know, blocking innovation, because that do happen, right? Like you do have regulations that are actually hindering innovation, and you know we don't want that. Like we don't. Mm. And you know these conversations are happening. We've just had a big Hopefully climate conference. Here, yeah. Uh, we see it happen here, you know, big climate conference in Egypt, you know, tons of startups got to go this year and engage. Hopefully policymakers are, you know, listening and engaging as much as they can. What do you think the future hold for digital healthcare? Oh, for digital healthcare? No, as I said, I think it's, uh, it's painful, obvious, and been painful, obvious, since we initially started that healthcare is going digital. That's ultra clear. And we did that early on. If you just look into the ICD codes, the diagnosis codes of a primary healthcare clinic, you realize that the majority of those consultations can happen digitally. And that's now slowly but steadily, or sometimes quicker, starting to happen, right? Uh, so we believe that more all and the majority of healthcare consultations will start online. The majority of the things will also be treated purely digitally and that's you know that's some the, the macro trend is ultra clear mm. and it's just a matter of like how how quickly can we reach that point and that will not solve all of the problems within healthcare but it will solve some of the problems in healthcare and as i said i think you know you can't just pour in capital in the rather ill-functional existing system and hope that that will change nor can you just add like a thin layer of digital on top of the rather real functional system. Like you really have to, and that's what we do. Like we combine technology with hardcore healthcare operations, and that's what you, when you really can create some, 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 some magic. Mm. Um, so it's it's not the silver bullet that's going to solve all our healthcare problems, but it's an important tool uh, for the future of healthcare in Europe. Yeah, and it, it is a tool. It's you know it's no like, health, like technology for the sake of technology. It's no no value, um, but you can use technology and product to improve efficiencies and improve access and improve and remove some of the inequalities when it comes to access. That could be done. Um, but you know, technology for the sake of technology, that doesn't serve any purpose. No. And you know, where are we on this journey? Are we you know, far ahead? You know, where... No, we're very much just getting started. Like very much. Like we've been operating this now for yeah, since 2015, but you know, we're it's, we still have a long way to go. As then, you know, healthcare is 10, 11 percent of GDP in all European markets. Just, it's just we're very much just getting started. I think that in the next five, ten years, you will see an awful lot of change in all European markets in this space. Mm. That's a future we're very much looking forward to. We are near the end, Johannes. If the entrepreneurs in the audience are to bring one thing from this session, what do you think that should be? 
Well, if you would bring one thing and we should tie it to regulations, I think what I've said plenty of times now, <laughs> don't, don't shy away from it. Like, there's no way around it. Like, in some areas, there's obviously is. Like, a lot of companies, you don't have to care too much about regulations, but if you want to go into to healthcare or other highly regulated industries, you know, then it's just the name of the game. And, you know, you have regulations that constantly change, you have to adopt to it. Um, and that would be my best advice. Embrace it, the price is big, less competition, just do it. Yeah, let's just, just do it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Johannes. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope you found this insightful and I wish you a great slush. Thank you. Great slush. <laughs>